how many of you will be traveling somewhere for Christmas? You know, over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. The horse knows the way to carry the sleigh through the white and frosty snow. And by the way, we didn't get snow today, so nobody's getting their sleighs out. We're going to travel by different means. We don't travel by horse and sleigh. We travel by car. And so some of you will probably pack up your car, head out for Christmas. Some of you will, will head to the airport. We will catch a flight to go somewhere. That's how you're traveling for Christmas. A lot of traveling going on at Christmas. And that's the way it's always been from the very beginning. Joseph and Mary had to leave their home, or their, the place where they were living, go way back down to Bethlehem for their registration to be counted among the people. And then we have those three guys, or maybe more. We don't exactly know how many wise men who traveled and, and were led by a star to the place of the birth of Christ. So traveling has always been a part of Christmas. Even our modern day Christmas story is about travel. There's that jolly old St. Nick. He's got a sleigh driven by reindeer. And so this is probably more of the realistic look. He doesn't look real happy. This is how he wants to travel. This is modern day Santa. <clears throat> He's going to get there fast. He's got a lot of deliveries to make. So Anyway, travel is a big part. And as we go through life, I want to talk today about the companions that travel with you. Because last week, we looked at the story of Mary and just how her life was turned upside down. How she had this humble little girl, probably a 13 to 15-year-old woman, looking forward to be married to this carpenter young man named Joseph. They're going to have a quiet life together, but it's not going to turn out that way. Because God met her through an angel and said, you're going to be the mother of the Messiah. And your life will never be the same again. And so Mary's life's turning a corner. She's going to go down a road that's going to be exciting. It's going to be painful. It's going to be confusing. And so she needs the help along that journey. And today I want to talk to you about how God helps us in the journey because maybe you're in a place of life as you're going through life's journey, you're going through a hard season. See, this is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. And oftentimes things like travel become very stressful. The expectations other people have of us are very high, you know, expectations to decorate, to buy gifts, to dress, to attend things. I mean, it's go, go, go during the holidays. I was out shopping at Walmart the other night. I said, I do not like this season of the year to be in stores. I get headaches. I mean, all this stuff uh, can build up the stress level in us. Then on top of that, this idea that I've got to be sweet with everybody, even people that maybe I don't get along well with, relatives that I've had arguments with, I'm going to have to put on the happy face. And some of you are dealing with actual loneliness and depression because some Someone very near and dear to you isn't here this holiday season. And so you're dealing with that. Or maybe you're someone who says, I wish I had someone near and dear to miss, but I'm I'm single and I don't have that person in my life. And so you're dealing with the stress too. So Christmas uh, is can be a very difficult time, and it seems like this this has got to be some diabolical twist. Because the Christmas story, as I remember it, was to be a message of good news, of great joy for who? All the people. So all the people should be joyful with this news, but the fact that we're not tells us something has gone horribly wrong. Something's gone wrong that we've missed the story. And our goal is going back to the Bible, actually the book of Luke, looking in the first couple chapters at the simple Christmas story. And let's make sure that we don't miss out this story because there's some great lessons in here that help us deal with the stresses and the challenges that come along with Christmas. And so we're going to pick up this story with Mary uh, in the book of Luke. But before we do, I want to, I want to, point out that Mary was told, and we went, as we shared last week, that her cousin or her relative, Elizabeth, was six months pregnant. Now, this is important. This was the sign because Mary's told that she's going to carry this child that was born in her through the Holy Spirit overshadowing her. It sounds kind of like a bizarre story. How am I going to explain this to my husband, to my friends, my family? Are they going to believe me because this doesn't happen? And why would God choose me of all people? I'm just a lonely little girl. And so she's dealing with this, this issue of how do I know this is really going to happen? And my understanding from my wife and other women is pregnancies don't show up like in the first few days. It takes several weeks, right? Ladies, nod your head if I'm right. Yeah. It takes several weeks. So how, is, how does Mary know this is really going to happen? What if she tells everyone and it doesn't happen? She sounds like she's crazy. So the angel says, Mary, here's a sign. Your relative, Elizabeth, six months pregnant. So... Mary's going to go find out because signs are, are big deals. A, a sign is in, in the Bible is a miraculous intervention of God that validates a person or a promise. So it's something miraculous God does to say, this, this is to prove that what I said is going to happen. So way back in the Old Testament when the, when the nation of Judah was in constant battle, God says, I'm going to come and deliver you, but I'm going to do it in a special way. 
And it says in Isaiah chapter 7, and this is a famous scripture quoted a lot at Christmas, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Pay attention. Here's the sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God said hundreds of years before Mary was even born, there's coming a time when I will show up in a big way. Emmanuel means God with us. I will show up in a big way and you will know it when you hear the news that a virgin is with child. Doesn't happen every day. In fact, it never happens except for the one time it did happen. So they were just to know when this thing happens, you know it is happening. God's keeping his promise. And so ideally, the nation of Israel should have been just waiting for this. And when they heard of this virgin with child, they should have said, this is the fulfillment of prophecy. But not everybody did that. So that's, that's a sign. In fact, Elizabeth, the cousin who's with child, uh, her and her husband received a sign as well. Uh, we don't have time to read their full story. You can read it in Luke chapter 1 at the very beginning. But Elizabeth and her husband, Zechariah, were devoted Jewish people, loved the Lord, godly people. They wanted to have children, but she could never conceive. And so uh, all through her life, as she's hoping and hoping, it's like, God doesn't hear my prayers. I'm not, I'm not going to have a child. And so she, she's, she's gotten older and older. In fact, Luke describes her, and my version of the Bible describes her this way. She is advanced in years. Very tactful, Luke. Advanced in years. Uh, we have no idea how old she is. He, he could have said she was as old as dirt, but he didn't say that. He said, he said she's advanced in years, kind of like you would put on a dating site. You know, if you're describing yourself, you know, I'm big boned, you know, that kind of thing, you know. So, so she's advanced in years. Ah, Luke, good, good terms there. Um, and her husband, Zacharias, is a priest. So he has the opportunity. He's chosen by lot, which is like rolling the dice. He's chosen to go in and offer the incense in the temple. And when he goes in to do this, an angel appears. A lot of angels in Luke chapter 1 and 2. Angel appears, and the angel says to Zechariah, the Lord is answering your prayers. Your wife is going to have a child. He's going to be a special child. He's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And there's certain things he can do and can't do. And Zechariah, the priest, didn't believe the angel. So the angel said, this will be a sign to you that this is going to happen. You will not talk again until that boy is born. And so he loses his speech. He knows now this is happening because I can't talk. He goes out there and people see that there's this expression on his face. If something happened in there, they don't know what. I imagine he wrote it out in the dirt. I mean, he's so excited. He gets home. He has to tell Elizabeth, but he can't tell her because he can't talk. So what does he do? He probably writes it out. I can't imagine him doing pantomime. So he probably writes it out. He says, Elizabeth, God is answering our prayers. And she says, well, I've been praying for you to be more quiet, but I didn't expect you to lose your voice. And you watch Fox News all the time and you talk all about your sports. And, but praise God, he answered my prayers. And he's, no, 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 not that one. The prayer about the baby. You're going to have a baby. And so Elizabeth is all excited. See, a sign validates. So this is the sign Mary was given. Elizabeth's already six months pregnant. So Mary decides, I got to go check it out. So here's what she does. Luke chapter 1. We'll pick up the story where we left off last week. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste. She's in a hurry into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. I want to talk to you about two significant companions that I believe each of us needs as we go through life, because life is hard, and sometimes life can be confusing, and sometimes things happen that we don't understand. You need companions to help you on the journey, and the first one is a good friend, a good friend. We all need a good friend. We don't know much about their relationship. We just know that Mary is related to Elizabeth. We don't see Joseph in the picture. I have a feeling Joseph wasn't invited to go. I, I have a feeling that Mary says, I've got, to show, I've got to find out that this is true first before I tell Joseph, because if Elizabeth isn't pregnant, I'm not saying anything about this. 
But if she is, huh, then our lives are going to change dramatically. And you may think that Mary lacks faith. Like, why didn't Mary just believe the angel? Why didn't she just say, well, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Why didn't she just say, I, I trust God, he, the angel said it, and it's going to happen, I don't have to go check it out. God is not opposed to us validating our faith. There are a lot of times in her life where I think God says, you know, check it out. It, 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 the reason she's even going is because she has some level of faith. If she didn't believe at all, she wouldn't have even gone. She has a level of faith. She just needs that little extra oomph. So she, she has enough faith to get there and sees Elizabeth to have her faith confirmed. Uh, you remember with Peter and John after the resurrection of Jesus, the, the women came back and said, uh, the angels told us that he's not here anymore. He's risen from the dead. And Peter and John, who are faithful disciples of Jesus, remember what they did? They ran back. They said, we have to see for who? Ourselves. We need to, before we tell everyone else he's risen from the dead, we just have to make sure that tomb's empty. And they wanted their faith validated. And so in the Bible, signs are given to help us believe, to validate faith, to say, you do have confidence. This isn't some fanciful story that I've just made up. It really is grounded in reality, grounded in history. And so she walks in the door. Elizabeth responds. She says, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Mary hasn't said a thing yet, as far as we know. And Elizabeth instantaneously knows that's the mother of Jesus. Now, she doesn't know his name's Jesus, but that's the mother of the Messiah. And maybe it was because Elizabeth knew that her son was to precede the Messiah. He, he was the um, forerunner, the one who was to pre prepare the way for the Lord. It was like, I know the Lord's coming soon, and boom, when she walked over, that's the one. That's the Lord right there inside her womb. That's the Lord that's going to save all of us. In the, the Mayo Clinic, says, friendship has major impact on both your emotional and physical health. People who have a close friend are much more able to endure difficult circumstances and trauma in their life. And so I hope that you have friends like I'm going to describe, because a good friend does several things. We see this in um, Mary's relationship with Elizabeth. A good friend makes time for us. A good friend makes time for us. Elizabeth invites Mary in. Mary visits. We're going to find out as we read the next section in just a little while. Mary stays there three months. Now, you, if, if you're pregnant, that, by the way, think about Elizabeth, the change in her life. I mean, she, she was actually getting ready for the next pal's potluck, making her casserole when her life changes. Says, now we got to pick out colors for the nursery. So her life's dramatically changed, and she's going through a lot. You know, how do I explain this to people? What just happened? It's just bizarre. And Mary shows up, and it seems like they don't have a lot in common because Mary is about 13 years of age. Elizabeth's probably, let's just say, 80 years old. She's older, advanced in years. So very different. And yet, they have some things really big in common. Number one, they both are very humble, godly women. We see that in the description. They're very devoted to the Lord, very godly, very humble. We also see that they have had shared miraculous encounters with the Lord. So if Mary's thinking to herself, who would ever believe a teenage girl telling the story of being visited by an angel and she was going to get pregnant miraculously, who would believe that? Maybe an 80-year-old woman who's miraculously pregnant. And so they have a lot to share in common, they the angelic visit, what God's doing. I mean, it had to be incredible for them to say, and then this happened, and then he said this, and just how they're just interacting with each other. And so Elizabeth says, hey, why don't you stay with me for a while? And she stays three months up to the time. It seems like if it's six months to nine months, maybe to the time of John being born. But Mary is with her, and, and Elizabeth made space for her. After the third service today, my wife and I are flying to Arizona we're going to spend a brief pre-Christmas uh, few days with our kids and our grandkids down there in Chandler. And uh, since we have a lot of friends still down in that area, we contacted a few of them. And I, I contacted two guys in particular and said, hey, I'd like to spend time with you when I'm down there. One of them is a pastor of a church, a church that my kids attend. I've sent him a couple messages saying, hey, if you've got time to spare, hour, hour and a half, I'd love to sit down with you over coffee or lunch and just visit with you. And I haven't heard back at all. My other friend worked with me in children's ministry for nine years, 
Uh, we, we've stayed good friends. We don't talk a whole lot, but when we do talk, we just pick up where we left off. And I texted him and said, hey, we're going to be down next week. I'd love to see you while we're down there. And within minutes, I got a text back. Hey, that'd be great. I'm free on Monday and Tuesday. Love to see you. A good friend rearranges their schedule and says, I've got time for you. Amen. And so I hope you have friends like that. When you are in a place in your life, it's, maybe it's your mother, maybe it's your father, maybe it's one of your kids, maybe it's uh, a sibling. I, I, I sometimes think you need a friend outside your spouse. I mean, your spouse is a good friend, but you also need another friend, that friend that you can just share with. And that may be someone you work with. Sometimes it's someone you went to school with years ago. They just, you bonded then and they stayed with you. You need someone who'll make time for you. Secondly, a good friend will listen to us. We don't know much about their conversation, but they had to be talking quite a bit about their shared experiences. When two people come together, their hearts form a bond. And we see that in the life of David. When David killed the giant Goliath, the king at the time was a guy named Saul. And Saul invited David to come and meet him. He says, I want to meet the, the, the boy who killed that giant. And he's amazed at David. He's so young. And yet David has already been anointed to be the next king of Israel. And so Jonathan, who's Saul's son, he's supposed to be next in line for the kingdom. It usually happens a father passes it to his son. But Saul has so rebelled against God that he's not going to be king for very long. David will be king. And Jonathan decides, I'm going to support David. I'm going, to, I'm going to defend David from my father. And in the very next chapter, after he slays Goliath, it says that Jonathan um, loved David and their hearts were knitted together. And so when David was being chased like a fugitive by Jonathan's dad, Jonathan was the one that he could confide in, that he could go to, that he can talk to. You need someone who really listened to you, someone who... Let you process your thoughts and emotions, someone that's a safe place. See, a lot of us, especially guys, will stuff things in. Like, I, don't, I can't talk to my kids about this, can't talk to my spouse about this. I don't know who to talk to, but I'm, I'm about ready to explode. And so I need somebody, and that person becomes that safe outlet. Now, let me caution you. That safe outlet needs to be someone who will listen and process things, but won't own them for themselves. One of the dangerous things I see sometimes is we, we share with someone stuff that we're going through, and pretty soon they're living it out in their life. And you need someone who's an unbiased, open ear, just, just allows you to process. Because sometimes we just need to get out the hurt and the anger and the confusion and the doubts and frustrations, get it out. And that person is that safe place to do that. We leave, we feel better because they understood us. Find someone that will listen to you. And then your good friend encourages us. If you look at what Elizabeth said to Mary, three times uh, Elizabeth blessed her. <laughs> blessed are you, the mother of the, my Lord, and blessed are you for, for believing what God has said. Blessing, blessing, God's favor upon you. I mean, she's speaking positive words into her life. We need friends that do that, friends who will lift us up, friends that will speak positive words. We don't need more negativity. There's too much of that in the world. We need someone who will speak positive things into our lives. I think there are two kinds of people Generally speaking, number one are those that, that will sap you. They drain you. You walk away from a, a spending time with them, you couldn't wait to get away. In fact, sometimes you felt like, this is dragging on, I got to get out of here, I'm going to explode, I've got to get away from this person because they just keep venting, they keep complaining, they keep whining, I'm not enjoying this, I'm getting tired. And so you pull away from that person because they sap you. You go home, you go, oh, that was exhausting. And while we have those people in our lives, we need an equal number, if not more, that will zap us. Zap us. It's like they, they infuse us with energy. You go to lunch with that person. You have a, a coffee with that person. Uh, you, you go on vacation, visit that family. You walk away saying, man, that was great. I can't wait to do it again. That felt good. I enjoyed that. Man, I miss those people. Those are zappers because they pick you up. They boost you. They infuse you with energy. Elizabeth is boosting Mary. She's encouraging her. Blessings to you. God's best to you. Favor to you. Elizabeth is a stabilizing force in her life. You know, sometimes our cell phones have these uh, features called sta uh, stabilizers that if your hand's shaky when you're taking a video, it kind of smooths the bumps out. A good friend will do that. They will listen to you and start to bring you back to reality. Start to make that story uh, sound not as, not as bad as you thought it was. In fact, 
I think it leads to the next part, which really is probably the best sign of a good friend, is they promote our faith. You might feel God has abandoned you. You might feel God is punishing you. You might feel like God is ignoring you. But the other person listens to you as you're sharing your story of the tragedy, the, the difficulty, the hard season you're going through, and they listen to that, and they process it, and they ask you questions, and they ask, get more impact, input, and then they step back and say, do you know what? Here's what I see. And they give you a perspective that's different than your perspective. In fact, one of the things your friend could do is you're so caught up in the cloud of emotions that they step back and say, I think God's opening a door for you. I think that in the midst of this, God's bringing something good out of it. I think you need to step back and see where God is in the midst of this. And that's what Elizabeth was doing with Mary. God's doing something great in you. I mean, God's unfolding his plan in your life, and you're experiencing it. Mary, oh, my goodness, how blessed you are. And I'm sure Mary says, I really am blessed. I really am blessed because of who I am and what I'm going through. And, yeah, it's going to be hard, and it's going to be difficult, and I'm going to have some confusion, but I'm blessed. I'm blessed in the midst of God's working in my life. I have a, a gentleman who's a mentor in ministry, and I see him about once a year. And we always spend a couple hours over coffee together, and he'll ask questions of what's happening in my family, what's happening in the church, and I'll share with him. And I always leave encouraged because he'll give another perspective of, of what he sees God doing in me, what God, he sees God doing in our church, and he always encourages me to take the next step of faith. And you need friends that will do that, not friends who get caught up in the emotion and cause you to spiral down. You need friends who will say, no, no. God's doing something right here, and this could turn out really beautiful. Do you have a friend like that? Do you have a friend who makes time for you, listens to you, is an encourager and lifts you up, someone who brings out God's best of what he sees or she sees in you? I hope you have at least one friend. Sometimes you have multiple friends like that. But if you don't, there's another companion that's the best companion. And that's what Mary finds as she enters into a moment of worship. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. The companion that she needed most of all is the companion you and I need. It's a gracious father, a gracious heavenly father. God was with her in the midst of this. And so she burst forth in this song of praise. It's called the Magnificat, which is the Latin word for exalt or praise or magnify. Think of the word magnification, magnificat. It means to, to make God big, make God great. It's not like Mary's going to create something that wasn't there. She's actually opening the view of her God, how big it is, how big he is, how wonderful he is, how worthy he is of praise. And so she burst forth in the song, which really sounds like one of the Psalms from the Old Testament. Uh, if you read this, you, you would think this sounds just like one of David's Psalms because it's so beautiful. It's, it's the longest Psalm in the New Testament. Uh, and you think of this girl who, like I said, she's 13, 14, 15 years of age. The depth of her theology in this is profound. She knows God better than most of the religious leaders of her day. And it makes me uh, start to realize maybe, maybe what we see in Mary here is why God chose her. It wasn't just he chose a random girl. He chose a girl who was so rooted in her faith, so strong in her understanding of what God was doing. This is she gets it. She's the one I choose. I don't know. It just, to me, makes a lot of sense as you look at this song of praise. So what, what stands out in this song of praise she gives? Who is this God? How does she relate to him? Well, first of all, um, this is a gracious Father who is worthy of our earnest praise. He's worthy of my earnest praise. When Handel's Messiah was, was first written, it was, and it was performed in 1743 in London, the King George II was in attendance. And if you've ever heard it, there's a, there's a rousing part called the Hallelujah Chorus. And during that, he spontaneously stood. Like, I can't stay seated anymore. He stood up. And everyone else stood up. And for 200 and, what, 70-some years, that continues to happen when 
the Hallelujah Chorus is played during Handel's Messiah. It still happens today. Now, there was a time 100 years after King George II when Queen Victoria was in power, and she was actually instructed when she went to hear the performance of Handel's Messiah, uh, you don't need to stand during that part. Everyone else is going to stand, but you don't need to. You're the queen. And so she, she didn't until it got to the part where it said, uh, our Lord omnipotent reigneth forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And she sprung to her feet. It's like, I cannot stay seated anymore. You know, I, I think worship sometimes is like that. It just builds up. It, it flows from deep within. Mary says, my soul, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit, something deep within me is welling up. I can't control it anymore. And there's no worship leader leading her. There's no band behind her. There's no lyrics for her to follow. It's just her and God. And I believe some of the most beautiful, sweet worship you'll ever present to the Lord will come when you're alone with Him. It'll be when you're reading your Bible and all of a sudden you push it away and go, I just got to praise God right now. That's so awesome. Or you're reflecting on what God's doing in your life and you say, God, thank you for what you did. Oh, my soul, I can't contain it anymore. God, you're so awesome. And you just shout it out. You're something wells up within you. That is the most beautiful praise to a father. And that's what, what's going on in Mary's heart right here. She sees what God is doing. And she can't hold it in anymore. She says, you're my Lord. Powerful term, meaning I'm under your authority. All kingdoms, all, all rulers are under you. You are Lord. You are sovereign. No one's greater than you. And I am here as your servant. You're my Lord. And then she says, you're my Savior. My Savior. Meaning Mary recognized she needed a Savior. You know, I know there's, there's people who, who actually worship Mary, believe that Mary became sinless when she was impregnated with, with Christ. Um, but that's not what the Scripture says. Mary was still a sinner in need of grace. Always. She needed her Savior. She had a special assignment from God uh, to be his mother, but, but she was honored. In fact, we should bless her for that, thank her for being that. But she, but she never once in this whole psalm says, I'm worthy of worship. She always points to, no, he's worthy of worship. God's worthy of worship. Uh, he's gonna, he saved our people in the past. You know, we remember the Exodus. We remember some of the battles. But he is saving us now from our biggest foe, sin. He is our Savior. One time uh, when Jesus was ministering, he was walking the streets and someone shouted out, a woman from the crowd said, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. And Jesus says, you want to know who the real blessed person is? It's the person who hears and obeys my word. That's the person who's blessed, which means that can be you, that can be me. Mary says, he who is mighty has done great things for me. Uh, when I think of worship, you know, I love the fact that I can sing a lot of songs that tell about just who God has been through history, biblical history and world history. But you know what really makes my worship deep within me? It, it's when I look at what he's done for me. When I say he's, he's not only just done great things, he, he built the mountains, he made uh, the, the red rocks of Garden of the Gods, he made the oceans, the star. He did, that's great. It's wor he's worthy of worship for that. But you know what really triggers the excitement within my soul is, but God, then you did this for me. You did something for me. I met with a couple last night, and you're going to hear their story in, in, at Christmas Eve service. God did some amazing things in their life to, to lead them from a place, place, place of desperation. And... Um, and that came across that God did this for us. God did this now, 2019 for us. Think about that. I hope, I hope your worship flows out of a place like that. Because we, like Mary, have a reason to praise him. Great things he has done. Holy is his name. There is no name like his. Holy means it's set apart. It's special. We don't cuss his name. We just don't throw it around like it's an everyday word. When I say Lord, when I say Jesus, it is something special. Holy Unique, beautiful is that name. So her worship springs, uh, this earnest worship from her view of God. Secondly, she recognizes that he's wonderful in his, his unusual ways. She speaks both from her knowledge of Scripture and her own life, but it's God flips things upside down. God, God reverses the fortunes. Here's how he does it. Those that in the world are proud, he brings down. And those that are humble, get brought up. 
The Bible says a lot about pride, and pride keeps us from having a relationship with God. Pride basically says, I'm sufficient in myself. I did what, um, what I needed for myself. I thank myself for where I am today. And we see that in a king in the Old Testament named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar strutting around on his palace. You know, Look at what I've done for myself. Look at this kingdom that I built. What a place. All because of me. And the Bible says immediately he became like a wild animal and was led out into the wilderness where he, where he resided for years until he humbled himself and repented and came back and said, you're God, not me. You are awesome. You are holy. You are all powerful. And we have to come to a place where we do that. Sometimes it's a little easier when you've grown up in humble circumstances. I mean, Mary was very poor. And so she lived, I mean, the world situation caused her naturally to be in a humble place. And you can see that around the world. A lot of people live in humble circumstances. They have great faith, but their lifestyle shows that their conditions have humbled them. The problem for us in a prosperous area like the United States or the Western culture is it is so easy for us to let our environment, our success in our jobs, our cars, our houses, you know, how we look, our fitness, all this to say, you know what, I'm pretty awesome. I'm pretty good. I don't really know if I need God that much, maybe a little bit. Give me a little boost over the edge into eternity, but I'm pretty good right here. And sometimes the best thing God can do for you is to knock you off the throne. You're not king of the hill. And to get down and to be humiliated in a sense. If you don't humble yourself, you will be humiliated because God loves you and wants you to to be grateful for what he's done. He wants to be the one that you worship, not yourself. So God flips the table Proud become low, the humble become exalted. And then he says he sends away the rich and fills the hungry. So he sends away the rich, not because they don't need something to eat, but he's not speaking of the physical food. When you eat food, you'll be hungry in a few hours. I mean, that's a perpetual thing. There'll always be hungry people among us. There'll always be poor, people needing food among us. But there is a sense of, of a spiritual hunger that he says, I will fill that. I will satisfy that hunger. Jesus said, um, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So God wants to fill the hunger, but you have to have that hunger. And and the, the, the finger pointing at the rich people, isn't that God doesn't like rich people? God loves rich people. But oftentimes the situation is like this. If I'm rich, I've already met all my needs. I don't need to ask God to meet my needs. I'm already full. Person over here says, I don't have a whole lot. I'm praying all the time for God to help me earn a decent paycheck and put food on the table and for me to, you know, help my kids have the clothes that they need and, and be able to attend the things that they want to do. And I'm always praying for God to provide and God keeps providing. It's because God fills where there's hunger. And so Mary just praised him for God's unusual ways. She saw that in history. She saw that in her own life. And then she saw also that God was working out his eternal plan. Mary referenced Abraham in in this, and Abraham's offspring. And she knew from her knowledge of Scripture that God had made a covenant with Abraham hundreds, if not thousands of years before, where God had said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. Your name will be great. Your offspring will be as numerous as stars in the sky. And from you will come one, one offspring, one seed of your loins, who will become a blessing to all the nations on the earth. And so all through the Old Testament, they kept looking forward to that Abraham's name became great, always recited Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham's great. We love Abraham. We're, we're connected to Abraham. His, his offspring become numerous. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people came, uh, became Jews just through birth, through the growth of the nation. But it was this one moment where, where God says, okay, this young woman named Mary, she is going to carry the seed that will be the blessing for all the nations on the earth. How privileged Mary must have felt. The fulfillment of God's covenant promise is happening right here. The one who will reconcile people with God, who will forgive their sins and give them eternal life, it's going to happen now because of what God is doing in history in my life. And so Mary has a unique place in history, but in many ways, Mary is just a person like you and me. And she found a a good friend in Elizabeth, but she found an even better friend in her gracious Father in heaven. And I wonder sometimes as as you look at your life, how God is working out his plan in your life. See, Mary's story was now being interwoven with God's story. Mary's life made sense in the big picture. 
And I know for me personally, when I gave my life to Christ, all of a sudden I started to understand, this is why I'm here. This is why I was put on earth. And, and I began to find direction for what I needed to do with my life. And for many of you, you, as you go through life wondering, why am I here? What am I supposed to do? You need to step back and see, God is weaving my story into His. It doesn't mean you have to be a pastor or a missionary. It means that God wants to use you where you are to glorify Him and to show other people the way to Christ. And sometimes I think that God puts you in a specific place at a specific time to write the next page in your story. For example, there's so many times where people have told me when they've left church, Pastor, God, God spoke to me today something that I needed to hear because of what I'm going through in my life. It's like God gave that message just for me. And I really believe that when you come to church, it may not just be random. It may be that God says, I've prompted you to get up today and to be here because I have a message for you. Because he's trying to get your story to weave into his story. And it begins when you simply say, like Mary did last week, I'm here as your servant, Lord. May it be as you've said. It's just to surrender ourselves to him because God's been working all through your life to get you to this place. He's been faithful in your life to get you to a place where you would see what he's doing and see the bigger picture, go back, go, ah, now I see it. And now I see what God's doing. And just go on the journey with him. Let him be the father that takes your hand as you go through life. And so we're going to sing this song. And I'm going to invite you to just surrender to Jesus. To give your life to the Lord who loves you. Who's working out this plan in your life. So go ahead and stand. Prayer partners, if you'd be available up front here. And as we sing this, if God is stirring in your heart, maybe God has you here. Maybe you're one of them that says, I believe God has me here for today because I needed to see something. I needed to hear something. I needed to see that baptism. I needed to hear that story. Come and just confirm that before the Lord. Say, God, I hear you today. And I surrender to you. I receive what you have to give. And I want to go on this journey with you. So if you need to respond today, our prayer partners are here. If you remain where you are, just surrender yourself to the Lord as we sing.